Thank you very much. The stage is yours. Has that shared OK? It's working. Very, Perfect. Very good. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Jeff West and I'm going to talk about um, advanced microstructural characterization of steels using modern electron microscopy techniques. Um, like Carl said, I'm geographically located across the corridor from him. Um, so um, we, we, we kind of occupy uh, different halves of the same building. I'm going to start with a brief pers um, historical perspective on electron mi electron microscopy. Um, this is so that I can define my use of the word modern in my title. Um, I'm then going to give a brief introduction to our characterization centre because it is unusual to have a university um, where you've got a characterization suite that is specifically configured for looking at steels. Um, I'm then going to um, introduce our through the length scale chemical analysis capability and show how we're using it for various forms of precipitate and inclusion analysis using a few case studies. Then I have a slide each on some of the other techniques that we're using to characterize steels at WMG, and then I'll draw a couple of conclusions. OK, so um, I first used electron microscopy in 1997. So from my perspective, that's when time began um, during um, my final year undergraduate project. Um, and this slide shows the microscopes that were available to me at this time. Um, the first observation is that all the microscopes were in small dark rooms. And although that in one of the pictures there was something that resembles um, a, a, a computer, um, these microscopes were not run by computers in these days. The other point is that these microscopes were not so easy to use. And this is important as extensive training requirements are a barrier to widespread use. Um, the final point is that all these systems have now been scrapped and I was actually given the honour of turning off the 2000 FX for the last time before it was re removed and replaced a few years ago. Um, this central microscopy facility at Warwick moved to a new purpose built facility about 15 years ago, but a similar one microscope per room format was retained in this centre. Um, at Warwick, the Advanced Steels Research Centre at WMG also has a microscopy suite at Warwick University. Um, and this looks very different from the central microscopy facility and indeed most other microscopy labs in the country. All the microscopes are together in a single light open plan workspace. Um, and this arrangement certainly does have some advantages in terms of keeping eye on student users um, and working on um, several systems in parallel. Um, we put together this centre about five years ago um, and the suite of systems were chosen on the basis of how good they are for st studying steel samples. So large pieces of magnetic material that at least in an SEM are not that beam sensitive. Um, there's also a TM located in the corner of the lab. Um, this is an analytically strong FEG based system, ideal for high, high spatial resolution chemical distribution mapping of both thin foils and extraction replicas. Um, which are used extensively to, to characterize steel microstructures. Um, when we put this in the lab five years ago, um, the, the very thought of putting a system of this ilk in a light, large, open plan lab was a pretty crazy thing to do. Um, obviously, if you were putting a, a high end aberration corrected system, you would still need to make sure that you had a, an appropriate room with um, the, the a required um, temperature stability and things like that. I mentioned earlier on that um, that I started when I started using electron microscopes, they were very difficult to operate. This slide shows an extreme example of how simple things are now. Um, the desktop SEM is an extremely easy to use, um, and this slide shows children operating the system at an outreach event that we had at WMG. Um, but the key point here is, is um, it's important to say that although the operation of the microscopes is is now much simpler. The interpretation of the data is not simplified and students generating lots of data from black box type systems introduces a whole new set of challenges. So what makes the centre specifically configured for looking at steels? Well, one of the main elements is our chemical analysis workflow that allows us to map chemical distribution at high sensitivity from the tens of centimetre length scale all the way down to the atomic level. To do this, we have three main systems, a micro XRF, 
which allows us to study the homogeneity in the tens of millimetre image field width range. Um, an analytical um, FEGSEM that can work happily um, from a few millimetres um, to a few tens of micrometres image field width range for chemical analysis. Um, and then when we run out of resolution in SEM for analytical work, um, we can move to the TEM where we can go all the way to um, atomic resolution if we need to. We also have a WDS um, and these systems are becoming less useful because of the continual improvements in EDS, but they're still needed for things like quantitative carbon profiles in steels and to resolve certain peak overlap issues. OK, um, one of the other things when we go to the TM is that we have a because it's a higher voltage instrument, it gives us a, a larger analytical range than the SEM and consequently um, some of the peak overlap issues in SEM can resolve simply by looking at the higher energy characteristic lines in these materials. Um, in addition, we have a SIMS attached to a dual beam um, and this can combine much higher spatial resolution than the EDS and the SEM with much higher surface sensitivity. And I want to show you one quick example of when we, this was achieved in our system. So this act, example is the only example I, I'm going to show that's not from a steel. Um, it is from a thin film photovoltaic um, where we have a CAD tail layer that we are analysing. The SIMS clearly shows chlorine present at the grain boundary, something you'd normally only see um, in a TM. However, the sensitivity SIMS is very dependent um, on how easy the species is ionised. So it's very well suited to looking at elements like lithium, sodium and sulphur. Um, so very good for battery materials, but the applications of analysing steel materials is, is very niche. OK, so moving on to my first um, case study. Um, at WMG, we have, a, we have a project sponsored by the Electric Power Research Institute in the US to look at what within a microstructure makes nine chrome steels susceptible to either reduced life, um, re reduced ductility, which can result in a very sudden failure, or both reduced life and reduced ductility. Although we have looked at many samples, today we're only going to look at two of them, both from the same X service component, a section from the T piece and a section from barrel two. We can see that under the same creep test conditions, um, the B2 sample had much lower ductility, and this can be seen from the, um, the, the, the photo in the, in the bottom left, and also had a much lower time to rupture than the TP1 material. Um, bulk, bulk composition analysis was done for both, and they are both within the allowable range for the grade. However, the B2 material clearly contains higher quantities of tramp elements than TP1. However, for today, we're not going to look into the specifics of the damage tolerance within the microstructure. We're simply going to look at how we quantify the microstructural features of these two materials. And to make things really simple, we're going to we're going to quantify the Lavis phase particles, which are known to precipitate during aging at surface temperature in these materials. Um, and this slide shows an example um, for both B2 and TP1 samples where the Lavs particles can be seen to the can be seen as um, bright features in the in the micrographs. Lavs phase are perhaps the easiest microstructural feature to quantify in these materials because they're easily differentiated from the steel matrix using backscatter imaging because of their higher um, average atomic number um, than the, the than the matrix and they are relatively coarse, often in the hundreds of nanometer size range. So resolution is not often a problem for FEGSEM to measure the whole size distribution. It is then a relatively simple to collect a number of images with an appropriate sampling strategy and then using image analysis to calculate the number and size of the lavs phase precipitates. Um, in this work here, we've collected 20 images in rows across the sample, each image separated by a millimeter and then we have ordered them in terms of the area coverage we measure. Um, we don't have so many particles in each image, so it's easy to conclude that the, the differences between images are a statistical effect, perhaps skewed by the fact that Lav's phase likes to form on um, certain types of grain boundaries. 
Um, the next question is, how appropriate is the um, sampling strategy we're using? This depends on what segregation characteristics the material are and whether you want the average characteristics or whether you want to know what the microstructural features are like at an extreme location. Um, what we've got here is um, some XRF derived um, chemical distribution maps where we can see the B2 material contains segregation bands, whereas in the TP1 material, um, the segregation appears as, as cloud-like features. Um, this difference in segregation um, behaviour is easily explained by the different product forms of the two materials. Um, B2 is a pipe and um, TP1 is a forging. In these maps, we can see that the amount of molybdenum varies from about um, 0.76 um, to 0.94 weight percent in B2 and 0.78 to 1.08 weight percent in TP1. Um, since molybdenum is a major element within LAVS phase, we wanted to look at whether we could measure differences in the LAVS phase characteristics in uh, positively and negatively segregated regions. Um, so the first thing we needed to do was find the corresponding area in the SEM. Um, for the TP1 samples, where the segregation clouds have a diameter in the hundreds of micron range, this is a fairly straightforward by lining the features within the sample. Um, however, for the B2 samples where the bands are typically only around 20 micrometers wide, we wanted to be able to see the bands in the SEM, so we were sure we were at the correct location. Um, and this slide shows how the approximate area was located by lining features and then ultra long acquisition EDS maps were collected to fine tune the location. These e SEM um, EDS maps were collected with a modern um, EDS detector at an input count rate of 250,000 counts per second. So we're working it pretty hard um, and we collected for about 12 hours. Um, and this length of scan was needed to see the segregation bands in these materials. You know, the difference in molybdenum between a positive and negatively segregated region is only around um, 0.2 weight percent as measured in, in the SEM. So what my student Shahid did next was he collected images from both um, positively and negatively segregated bands within the microstructure and compared the results from the random approach used initially. What this shows is that the variations are primarily due to segregation effects and not um, statistical variations. So when we look at the um, negative areas, they're towards the bottom of the um, distribution and the positively segregation bands are towards the top. And one of the key points here is that in the, in the um, TP1 sample where you've got the um, diffuse clouds, which might not be hit with a, um, a rat with a um, sampling strategy, you can get very different results. Um, we can also compare the size distributions, um, and this shows that it, in the same um, positive negative regions of, of both samples. Um, this suggests that nucleation and last phase is dependent on um, molybdenum content, but it is um, but it is not. Um, Sorry, the segregation nucleation is not dependent on the molybdenum content, but growth is not. Um, the results do have important implications for this type of analysis because when comparing a series of samples with different aging or stress profiles, it would be important to ensure that the areas with similar segregation characteristics are being compared. Um, so moving on to a, um, a new case study, um, this time we were looking at dissimilar metal welds. Again, these are X service materials and the overall aim is to understand the creep cavitation behavior of the material. Um, I was also asked the question, what is the composition of the weld metal? Um, and when we used the XRF derived chemical distribution maps, um, these showed that each weld bead had a very different composition. Um, we could also see, particularly in the niobium map, that there is compositional variations within weld beads as well. We can then do the quantitative analysis 
and we see that for the parent metal we get compositions consistent with a stainless steel and a P91 steel as we expected. Um, but the true extent of the compositional differences between the weld beads becomes apparent um, where the iron content varies between 50 to 20 percent depending on which bead is being looked at. This is particularly important because damage near the weld um, um, parent fusion line was reported. Um, so the next thing we did, we can collect um, large area backscatter um, maps across the fusion line and, and uh, both into the weld metal and into the parent. So we can pick out features of interest, um, such as in this case, we're interested in areas of the highest cavitation. And on the right, we've um, mapped um, where the areas of um, highest cavitation are. We can then directly relate these maps with the composition maps collected with XRF, although we have to be mindful that they're going to be other parameters than just the composition that determine where um, cavities form. This allows us to target where we do the more detailed imaging analysis. Um, this is a, um, an iron beam induced secondary electron image. Um, these images provide very strong conductivity contrast, allowing um, carbides and nitrides to be easy, easily differentiated from the matrixes. Um, this shows adjacent to the fusion line, there's a relatively coarse, um, discontinuous band of particles in the parent metal adjacent to the fusion line. Um, coarse particles are of particular significance in these materials are they, as they are potential um, cavity nucleation sites and indeed creep cavities observed near these coarse features. We also find that these particles are found across the whole fusion line, which suggests that their formation is not sensitive to the weld metal composition. So then we try to see what these particles are like using SCM-EDS. Um, at the fusion line, we can see that the relatively coarse particles contain mainly nickel, molybdenum, chromium, vanadium and silicon. Um, we can see that the chemistry of these particles is different from the fine particles further from the fusion line, which have compositions consistent with M23C6 and Lavis phase, which are very familiar to us in these materials. Um, the big benefit of looking at these in the SEM is that it's fairly easy to, to see if we're getting the same basic composition of particles as we move up and down the fusion line, which is something that we, we did. However, in order to unambiguously identify a phase um, based on such SEM-EDS maps is, is not so easy, especially when you have to use low KV to get the spatial resolution um, in order to um, see these particles clearly. So um, to enable us to look at these in more detail, um, it's natural to move to the TM next. Um, Preparing TM samples using FIB is now very well established and for these materials allows the sample to be prepared in a specific location, but a defined specific location, um, which is in this case is at the fusion line halfway between a specific weld bead. Um, FIB samples typically only produce um, an electron transparent area that's maybe five by five microns, but in this case a sample with electron transparency length of about 30 microns was prepared so that the precipitates um, over a longer distance into the parent um, could be analysed. This sl slide shows the low magnification, um, bright field and high angular dark field images at the fusion line um, with a weld metal on the left and the P91 steel on the right. Um, a band of precipitated phases um, can just about be seen um, near in the um, P91 side of the material. There's also a hole um, towards the top right of the image, which is a creep cavity. Um, we can also see that there is no apparent contrast gradient across the image, which suggests that the thickness of the sample is fairly uniform, which is a really good news from a chemical mapping point of view. Um, when we do um, chemical maps across the fusion line, Again, we can see um, the precipitated phases are rich in nickel, chromium, vanadium, which is very, which is consistent with what we saw in the SEM. We can also see um, copper rich precipitates near the fusion line, and we can see manganese enrichment at the fusion line as well. 
the silicon surrounding the cavity is consistent with um, colloidal silica contamination during the metallographic preparation of the sample that was undertaken prior to the fib um, based uh, TM pre preparation. Um, we can then extract spectra from the maps and then perform quantification, but being mindful, of course, that there's likely to be a, a significant contribution from the matrix on the values we obtain. Um, however, we get um, values um, for the M20C6, which are consistent with what we think we, we would expect to get, um, and we're able to get um, a composition of the major elements um, for this um, phase we hadn't really seen before. When we look at the low end of the spectrum, um, we can see that there's a nitride, there's nitrogen peak um, in this phase, um, and this together with the, the composition and diffraction analysis we did on it suggests that it's a, an M6X, um, a phase that has not been documented to form at the fusion line um, in nine chrome um, welds before. OK, so moving on to um, a final example. Um, and this time we're looking at um, inclusions and large precipitates in a grade 92 steel, um, where there's an interest in the number of potential sites for creep cavity, creep cavity nucleation. Um, and on the basis, we included um, boron nitride in the analysis. So we use an automated inclusion analysis process. And here is one example of um, one of the fields analysed where we were able to detect um, three different types of inclusion. Um, boron nitride, manganese sulfide and alumina. We wanted um, to detect all inclusions and we wanted to scan as large area as possible. However, a suitable trade off has to be made um, because there may not be much value in collecting thousands of fields at very high magnification. Also, if you move a large sample with magnetic properties over significant distances, um, then the sharpness of the image is likely to be affected by beams, beam, beam astigmatism, um, assuming that you're able to produce a completely flat sample so that focus variations are not significant as well. However, another problem is how homogeneous is the sample? Because answering this question will help us to define where the best place to scan is and how big of area we need to cover. Uh, sorry, I would like to, to, to mention it's uh, 1810 uh, to let you know. OK, uh, OK, I will I'll wrap up in one minute. OK, so um, the key points here are that um, segregation um, is significantly affecting the um, inclusion characteristics of the material. Um, and the inclusion analysis um, that we that we do. I'll just skip on to the um, conclusion slide. Um, so it's important to understand that the chemical homogeneity of sample um, before starting analysis. Um, segregation bands um, are often hard to see um, in these nine chrome steels, have a significant effect on the local number and density of precipitated phases. Um, and in welds, the situation is more complicated because segregation um, in the parent is combined with complex heat treatments from the welding process. Um, and segregation can affect um, larger precipitates um, and inclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much.